name we pray. Amen. As David comes, I got a call right before this service. Dad's taking mom to the ER. She has an irregular regular heartbeat, so they're trying to get her under a, some sort of test so they can figure out what's going on. So perfect timing. They're getting ready to leave, I think, tomorrow. So you know how that is, how that will work. So anyway, keep her in prayer. David, come lead us in some singing, bud. Let's turn over to uh, page 328, or 382, sorry. <laughs> page 382, Standing on the Promises. Sing it out on the first. Standing on the promises of Christ my King, through eternal ages let his praises ring. For he in the highest time will shout and Are you washed in the blood? Page, page 256. Are you washed in the blood?
that's okay. Amen. All right, just a few announcements, and then Brother Rob will come. We'll dismiss our teens to their class. Brother Rob will come and teach tonight. Uh, anyway, this week, pretty typical week. Uh, of course, uh, tomorrow we'll have our Bible study there in Snohomish, so I hope you'll join us for that. We just sent out, uh, we got to use our nonprofit postage for the first time, so it saved us $700. Uh, huge, so praise the Lord. Thank you, Uncle Sam. Anyway, uh, and so we were able to send out 5,000 invitations. This was uh, part of the money we received from Wooden Valley. Uh, we were able to send out 5,000 invitations. They'll go out uh, the end of this month, beginning of June, to the Bible study on Thursday nights. And so we'll be praying for those as they go. Uh, very excited. We had a, uh, some, some of you know I went Sunday night and preached at Wooden Valley. And uh, just a great response. I've got four or five people who said, man, we want to go door knocking. We want to help evangelize. Amen. And uh, they actually have two of the chaplains for Snohomish County Fire District 4, which includes Snohomish. Uh, two of the chaplains actually attend the church there. So uh, I don't know. I think the Lord's opening some doors. And uh, some of you know it's been a little discouraging as of late. Uh, just winter's hard, you know. It's, and, uh, and so I'm excited about what is coming. So be there tomorrow night, Thursday uh, at 7. And then, of course, Saturday will be outreach both here and in Snohomish. Um, and then Saturday night men's prayer meeting. Now, this Sunday is Mother's Day, so we'll have a special thing for all of our mothers, and we're looking forward to honoring them as well. And then uh, coming up, uh, the young ladies have their outing on the 17th, and then the ladies' luncheon is on the Saturday the 18th. What, t what time is that? Is that at 11? Okay, 11 a.m. That's a great event to invite other ladies to. Uh, you, will, you, will, you will enjoy it. And so I'm looking forward to hearing good reports on that. And then, of course, teens, Silverwood, if you did not sign up or tell Brother Matt you were coming, uh, you still have an opportunity to go. It's just going to cost you 10 bucks more, all right? And so, uh, but uh, we paid for 11, 11 people to go. And, uh, and so if, you, if you're having a hard time, you say, I can't go because I just don't have the money. I do have people that have, have said they would be willing to help sponsor you. And so if you want to be a part of that, see Brother Matt, and uh, we'll make sure to get you on the list. And then there is a Memorial Day church picnic at the Boises. So uh, I think Sister Christy brought a whole package of conies. If you don't know what conies are, they're these white, I don't know. Yeah, anyway, so uh, anyway, we're going to have a great time. <laughs> That's the most excited I've seen Brother Matt in church in a few months. Anyway, but it's good to have my wife back. Of course, she spent the last week there in New York, and she had a great time with her sisters, so uh, praise the Lord. Um, but anyway, that's, uh, that's some of the announcements. Don't forget church camp. I know some of you have tried to sign up. If you're having trouble signing up, see me. I think we have an issue. I need to let Anna know. I don't think Anna's here. Anna's upstairs. But anyway, I think what happens is if you don't have a birth year on your, uh, your profile in planning center, you can't sign up. We got to know what year you were born. So, and you can't change it. So it's really annoying. I don't know why, why that is. So, but, uh, uh, if, you, if you'd like to, you say, well, Pastor, we don't have the money right now. What's most important is I just need to know that you're coming uh, so we can buy uh, the, the appropriate amount of food, okay? So please, if you're planning on coming, let me know. And uh, we spent a, a couple hours today, or at least an hour today, working with Anna and Caleb, planning out all the activities. I know we've got a church kickball tournament going to be happening. Uh, we got a, I think Brother Wilder's bringing a powerboat, so we're going we're gonna to get on a tube and go tubing around Deer Lake there. Awesome. And so... Yeah, amen. All right. I'm going to make you sign a waiver for that one, though. I am not getting sued if you, uh, if you get launched onto the shoreline, okay? So, or into a, run into somebody else. So anyway, uh, but this camp's really nice, and uh, it's got actually, it's got a big water slide. So uh, I know we'll really enjoy it. We'll have so, separate, separate swimming times for the, the men and the women. And uh, so we're, we're going to have a great time. Brother Rossiter is going to preach for us. He's from a, a church down in Florida. Uh, you'll really enjoy them. And there's two other churches that will be joining us for church camp. So uh, Brother Glover's cooking, man. And every time he cooks, we, we get fatter. So uh, we can, there's no complaints about his cooking at all. So it's going to be, it looks like it's just coming together. And, and so if you're, if you're interested in going, uh, you say, well, I can't stay overnight, but we can come during the day. That'd be awesome. Come, come for a couple of evenings and uh, just enjoy the fellowship. And so I'm looking forward to that. That's June 10th. I believe June 10th to the 14th is the plan right now, something like that. All right. Did I miss anything? Let's do this. Teens, you'll be dismissed to your class. Uh, and then Brother Rob, why don't you come teach tonight? Sister Deanna, did they kick you out of your class? Wow. Yes. No, no, it'll be at the camp. 
Yeah, that's a good question. Amen. Brother Rob, come on up. All right. First John. You'll take your Bibles and turn to First John. Good to have you here tonight. I think what we're going to do is we're going to start by, um, I thought of this. I thought every week what we need to start with on our Wednesday night is our memory verses and look at those and make sure that we have an understanding of what we're looking at. So this week, if you haven't looked at your memory verse yet, verse 26, that's the easy one. These things have I written unto you concerning them that seduce you. Got that one. All right, I got one. The other one's a little harder to get up. But in order for these things to mean something to us, we want to figure out what is the message that God's trying to get across? And secondly, how does it apply to me? What's the application that we can have? And what what's the um, things that we can learn from it. So as we look at this passage, we first of all have to say, okay, what does it mean? These things have I written unto you. Well, you go back and you see what the message has been um, throughout the passage of Scripture, but I think particularly we've got verses 18 and following. So we look at verse 18 starting there, little children is the last time, and as you have heard that Antichrist shall come. Even now are there many Antichrists, whereby we know that it is the last time. He says, they went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would no doubt have continued with us. But they went out that they might be made manifest that they were not all of us. So he warns of the, those that would seduce you. He's going to talk about this is the things, these antichrists. They're, of course, we, we went into detail concerning that and talking about how they are opposed to the things of Christ. They're directly against, in opposition to Christ and the person of Christ and, of course, who he is and uh, his divinity, and the, the, the fact that God became man and dwelt with us, and denying that fact, and the, we studied the idea of Gnosticism and the other the cultic ideas of that time, that there's a, there's a great divine force out there that we can tap into, and, and uh, we get this, this deeper meaning and these deeper truths. And that's why he said, when we talked about the importance of the word, and I emphasize that over and over, Logos, and the idea of what that meant. To many, the Greek, that meant that was an impersonal divine power that was out there that you could, you know, subliminally tap into and grow in deeper in that way, but it wasn't personal, it wasn't. He said, the word that we're talking about, that person, the Logos, is the one that we've touched, our eyes have seen. That's why it was so important that he went through all the physical aspects. He was with us and he dwelt among us. We beheld him, you know, of, of who he was. God with us. And uh, he, of course, then gave his life for us, and he wants us to manifest ourselves. So he gives this warning. Then he goes on to say in verse 20, but ye have an unction from the Holy One. And uh, we'll talk about that, that unction and that anointing and how those join together in verse number 27. But um, who is a liar? Then verse 22, but he that denieth that Jesus is the Christ, he is Antichrist, that denieth the Father and the Son. He says, whosoever denieth the Son... That hath not the Father, but he that acknowledgeth the, acknowledgeth the Son hath the Father also. Let that therefore abide in you, which ye have heard from the beginning. If that which ye have heard from the beginning shall remain in you, ye also shall continue in the Son and in the Father. And he concludes with this thought, and this is the promise that he hath promised us, even eternal life and the joys that go with it. So with that, he says, I've given you these truths. I've given you these warnings. Don't let them seduce you. Be careful of these things that I've written unto you concerning them that want to do what? That idea of seduce means to lead astray. To lead astray, to draw out. And this idea is the act then. It refers to those that would seduce them from the truth or lead them into dangerous error. And that was happening in the early church. They were warning of these things and telling them, no, these are false teachers. Be aware what to watch for with these things. So he says, watch for them that would seduce you. I think of that verse and when it means to draw aside and to, to draw away from. What are we looking for here? Well, we're looking for that relationship with God, that walk with God, that fellowship. I'll use that term fellowship. We're, we're guarding our terms there. But the idea of a relationship was through the Son. He, he provided that. But that fellowship, that walk with God on a daily basis. And uh, I will set no wicked thing before mine eyes, it tells us in Psalm 101, verse 3. I hate the works of them that does what? Turn aside. And that's that same idea. It's drawing us away. 
It's the things that would draw us away from that fellowship and that closeness with God. And he says, I, ha I hate those things. I will set no wicked things, whether it be the aspect of pride or, or the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, those things. We're going to set those things aside because they draw me away from that closeness with God and that fellowship with God. Well, I had some of that this morning. That was so exciting to have that. There's a, boy, my work situation has been so much stress. You know, there's so much things to figure out. And, oh, trying to keep balance and, and things I'm not comfortable with and I don't know. And, and I'm trying to figure it all out. And with that, it keeps me up at night so often. And I've just been trying to practice of, and when, I, when I'm conscious of it and I realize that I'm thinking about work again, oh, I'm so tired of this, I think, okay, I'm going to focus on a person to pray for. And I pray for that person, and I go back to sleep. And uh, then I start thinking about work again, and it comes, and when I'm conscious of it, I think about somebody else, and I try to pray for them and try to do those things. Well, this morning, I was, you know, the turmoil and all the things, and this verse came. The verse came, be still and know that I am God. What a wonderful truth. And this, you know, I'm getting ahead of myself. We won't get into chapter 3 yet. But uh, when we look at chapter 3, that idea of we are the sons of God. Behold, what manner of love he hath given us. When we dwell on that, that's the God who I serve. That's the God who I love. My heavenly Father. What a wonderful truth and what, what peace we can have when we understand and we dwell on that fact. Be still, he says, though. Be still. What does that mean? Put those things aside. Put those fears and those turmoils aside. Lay them off to the side. Put on Christ. Dwell on him. Recognize your position in Christ, what you have. We're a child of God. And with that, so all right, there I got sidetracked. Back to verse number 27. Now we see verse 27. So verse 26, we understand, These things have I written unto you concerning them that seduce you, that would draw you away from that fellowship and that closeness with God and that understanding of who he is. But, he says, The anointing which ye have received of him abideth in you. And ye need not that any man teach you, but as the same anointing teacheth you of all things, and is truth, and is no lie, and even as, hath, as it hath taught you, ye shall abide in him. Now that's, you know, like we say, it's kind of wordy. So you think of the words that are through there, but they have meaning. These words have meaning as we think through here. So the first thing, we see the anointing which ye have received of him abideth in you. All right, help me out. As we're thinking of this, what do we have what do you think that anointing, we've, we've covered it in the past, but let's think about this. What is this anointing which you have received of him that abides in you? The Holy Spirit. You can't get any closer than that. That's, that's exactly what we'd see there. The anointing, we saw that with the unction, that idea that was back in verse number 20. That unction is that, that divine calling that's given there, that anointing. And we saw that anointing illustrated in the Old Testament that was for a purpose, a position, there was a, a calling that was there. And he says, as you, as a child of God, have been given the Holy Spirit. And what will the Holy Spirit do? When he's anointing you, what will he do? There's a number of things. Let's think about the Holy Spirit for a moment. What does he do for us in our lives? What's he given for? Go ahead, Miss Debbie. I see you. I was going to say, you're giving me all of them here. He convicts us, right? He convicts us. He convinces us. That's the way to look at that. He convinces us of the righteousness of God. He shows us that and convinces us and makes us realize that, whoa, when I compare myself to that, no, yeah, I'm not. <laughs> I'm not all that. I'm all that through Christ and what he's done. But he also will guide us into all truth, as it says in the book of John, as he talks about that. He will guide us into all truth. For he shall not speak of himself, but he will show you things to come. He's going to speak of Christ. But he tells us he's going to guide us in truth, convict us. But what's he called first? He was called this very first, the comforter. He's the comforter. Isn't that exciting? Because we all have struggles, don't we? We all have things we, you know, sharing about work. Work can get to you. And what do you have when you reflect on that and say, I have it all through him. I have the peace that passes all understanding the Holy Spirit, the Comforter that is there. So he is there. So moving on. The anointing which you have received of him abideth in you. It's there continuously with us. He's not going to go away like he did in the Old Testament. Then the Spirit came upon them and then he would depart. No, he's within us. It's not how much we have of the Spirit. We have all the Spirit that we're going to get. He's going to stay with us. 
It's how much the Spirit has of us. It's how much we surrender to Him and allow Him to guide and do these things in our lives. Going on, he says, And ye need not that any man teach you. Now, that can be taken arrogantly, can it? Can't teach me. I've got it all figured out. <laughs> no, of course not. What is he talking about here? And that's important to understand the context. The context is, it's not this deeper learning experience that I am so much higher in learning and I have this. In fact, you poor peasants can't know the scriptures. You can't know those things. You have to be explained all of it to you. And isn't there religions out there that don't encourage their people to read the word of God? They say, no, no don't, don't, don't read the word of God. No, you need it to be explained. We will explain it. Warning, that's a false religion. If they're not encouraging you to get in God's word. Isn't that what Paul said? He encouraged the Bereans. He was excited. Why? They wanted to prove what he said to the word of God. It was important to them that they tested it with scripture. And that's what we want to do in this, in this church and in, the, in this um, at Faith Baptist. Encourage you. Get into God's word. There you will find the answers. He's given that through us and he has given us the Holy Spirit to guide us in the truth. It doesn't mean we, doesn't, we don't have explanations and we have things that we can learn from it. The key is we have the Holy Spirit within us that was to, given to us to guide us into all truth. He will guide us, give us life through the word, not in contradiction to the word. There's the key. It's not above and beyond or in contradiction to the word. He will reveal what's in the word and how it then can apply to us. He'll take God's word and apply it to our lives. That's what the Spirit can do for us. So he says, Ye need not that any man teach you, but as the same anointing teacheth you of all things and is truth. There's what the Spirit is called to. He's called the Spirit of truth. He will guide you into all truth, it says. And it is no lie. It's not a lie. The Gnostics, as we said before, they had claimed they had a deeper truth. They had the divine revelation apart from the word and it tapped into the divine cosmos. No, 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 no. That's not true. The truth is we have the written word, the logos, logos, by which we can be instructed personally and learn what it means then as the end to abide and continue in him. And he says at the end, and even as it hath taught you, ye shall abide in him. So as we memorize this passage and we think of this this week, let's let the words sink in. Because we've got to get them up here first. But it can't stop there. From the head to the heart. From the head to the heart. And that's when it becomes personal and real. So let's go to the Lord in prayer, and then we'll continue on our lesson this evening. Father, we do love you. We do thank you so much for your blessed word and the, the promises that it gives, the, the lessons, the instruction that it has for us. Lord, I pray that you would give me the words tonight to say and that you would guide us into your truth and help us to understand our position in Christ, our position in God as sons of God, both what that means now and in eternity to come. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Last week we had looked into chapter 3. We got down into chapter 3 and verses 1 and 2 and we started into that and it says, Behold, what manner of love, what manner of love, what love in both kind and degree. What manner of love he hath given to us while he loved us, while we were yet his enemies. He loved us while we didn't deserve it. That was the kind of love he gave sacrificially. Of course, the degree he gave his life <laughs> in a terrible, most horrific way that we can imagine. He did it for us. And uh, what manner of love he hath bestowed upon us. And how did he show it? He gave us that relationship. He says, I've, I've given myself to make you from a son of the devil, basically you're children of the devil, now into the family of God, to bring you into sonship and all that that pertains. We talked about the privilege to receive provision, the privilege to receive protection and uh, training, the access that we have to our Heavenly Father. We talked about all these things last week. And then we have the, the privilege of an inheritance, the inheritance that we have, but all this is because of him, because of his father-to-son relationship. And it was all at no charge to us, but it cost him everything. You know, we think of that, it, no charge. Oh, there was a great charge. It just wasn't put on our account. It was his precious blood that was given to pay for our sins. 
So he took that. And the privileged relationship was granted to us at no charge to ourselves, but it was granted to us with the benefits. That's only the beginning. The privileges that we have, well, first of all, we have a glorious inheritance. All that the Father has belongs to Christ, and all that Christ has, he wants to give to us. He wants to bestow upon us. But now we continue in today's thought, as we say, to be like the Father. To be like the Father, it says in verse number 2, it says, Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And every man that hath this hope in him purifieth himself, even as he is pure. Purifieth himself, even as he is pure. How are we pure? Perfect, blameless. How? Because his righteousness is covering my sin. He became sin for us who knew no sin, that we might become the righteousness of God through him. When we stand before God, the presence of God, we have an advocate, Jesus Christ the righteous, as we learned about in chapter 2, verse 1. We have Jesus Christ, who is our advocate, but we also have an adversary, accuser of the brethren, as he's called, saying, they're not worthy. Look at all that they did. They've sinned, and he says, I've paid that. They're covered through me. I've paid that price. They're, they're sinless in, in my sight because of the work of Jesus Christ, what he did for me. But now we see the application. The more clearly we see him now, the more we will be like him now. This is the key to the lesson as we see this. The Christian is supposed to be like Christ. Like Christ. And we'll look at that. As, so let's turn back to John chapter 17. John chapter 17. Actually, I'll read this one and we'll go to Romans chapter 13. But John 17 verse 21 says that they all may be one as thou, Father, art in me and I in thee. And they also may be one in us that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. Of course, the prayer, the truly the Lord's Prayer. When we think of the Lord's Prayer, John 17 was the Lord's Prayer. The other one's the model prayer that he has given to us, our Father which art in heaven. This is the Lord's Prayer as he lifts up his heart to his heavenly Father and shows us what it's like to intercede on the behalf of others. Jesus was doing that in the garden. John chapter 17 gives us that. But he says that they may be one as thou, Father, art in me and I in thee. Maybe be, may be one in us. Romans 13, 14, though, we look at this. It says, but put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ and make not provision for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. That idea of putting on, to put on. The phrase put on in our language may be used as an expression to put on a front or an act or a, a show, to put on. They're putting on. The idea that we're going to, we're going to put on something, a, a, a show for someone, or we're going to do this. It, it's an idea, it doesn't have the depth that they had back in this language in the Greek. That's the idea to means to imbibe or to absorb. To absorb means to put on. They, of course, it's the idea pertaining to putting on a garment, putting it over, putting something on. But it is the idea of absorbing into the principles and the person of who Christ is. It's a deeper thought than just what we have. The idea of absorbing in it to become like him. To become like him. And I'll, I'll cover that. I, I keep saying that term, like him. I'm going to explain that. I don't want to get ahead of myself. But to uh, follow Christ. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Another idea that goes along that builds on this. 2 Corinthians chapter number 4 as we see there, he says in verse number 10 and 11, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, it says in verse 10, Always bearing about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our body. For, which, uh, for we which live are always delivered unto death for Jesus' sake that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our mortal flesh. With that thought, this idea of dying to myself, my way, but it's living out the, the life that Jesus did. He died in my place. He took my place. He was crucified for me. And thus, Galatians 2.20 builds on that. What does that say? 
Never, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. In the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. Lest we get any thoughts of, of grandeur, like, I've arrived, I've done it, I've got this. No, the only way we can live out the Christian life is by humbly realizing that we can't live out the Christian life. It's humbly accepting the fact that the only way to live as Christ has told us to live is by resting and trusting in His divine power and His ability and walking in His strength that He has put and allowing Him to live through us then. That's how we live out the Christian life. No, this idea of becoming more like Christ, there's two ways to see that. And like I said, I'm, I'm getting to that. It's in my notes and I keep getting ahead of myself. But the, I'm just basically, the idea is, I'm like Christ. There's a proud, arrogant way to say I've arrived and I've done this. The correct way is acknowledging and understanding that it is not me. In me that is in my flesh dwelleth no good thing. That's the Apostle Paul writing through, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. In me that is in my flesh dwells no good thing. And he goes through the whole conflict that's all there. And what's the answer? But I thank God through Christ Jesus. <laughs> That's the answer. It's through his strength and his ability that we can have strength. But here, we're crucified with Christ. We're, we're putting off this. Colossians 3, then, one more concerning putting off. Colossians chapter 3 tells us in verses 9 and 10. He says, Lie not one to another, seeing that ye have put off the old man with his deeds, and have put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him. There you go. Put off the old man with his deeds, and I've done what? Put on the new man. But how? How? Follow on that verse once again. Which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him. We get to know him. We know Christ. We study him. We learn about him. Who is Christ? Who is Christ? He is the word. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. Jesus Christ. This is how he makes himself known. And since Jesus is God, we see, secondly, God's essential nature is one of holiness. He's emphasized that through the book of John, 1 John, the idea of be holy, walking in holiness, and uh, walking in truth. But he says here, that then holiness is defined most simply as being like God, being like God. Now, that's what I meant. Not God-like, like Satan. I will be like the Most High. <laughs> I will be as God. Like Adam and Eve. You can say, oh, God's holding you back because you will be like him. Oh, well, we want to be like him in ways that he didn't design for us to be. He didn't want us to have the knowledge of evil. He didn't want us to do these things. He didn't plan that. Yet we will be like God because we will know these things. No, that's the self-recognition. It's not the manner of replacing God or even mimicking God. You know, the pastor used the illustration. I always like that. The idea of be like Mike. That was back in the 90s. You know, be like Mike. That was Michael Jordan. It doesn't matter how much I jump and do all these things. I'm never going to dunk the ball from the free throw line or, you know, I'm never, well, I'm never going to touch the rim anymore. I can't even touch the rim. Yeah, you know, it's not going to happen. Be like Mike. Try hard, aspire harder. What am I going to do if I try to be like Mike? You know, using the illustration of basketball, Michael Jordan. I'm going to get discouraged if I truly, that was my goal. Because I'm going to try and try and try and realize I can't do it. It's impossible. I'm not Mike, you know. I'm not going to do that. But in the spiritual realm, exactly what that is. Oh, I'm going to try harder to be like Christ. I'm going to work harder at being like Christ. No, it comes to a submission to him that says, I can't, Heavenly Father. And he says, come along, son. That's why I say, take my yoke upon you, because I'm on the other side. I'm with you. <coughs> Excuse me. And I'll walk with you. And I'm going to be your strength. I'm going to be your source. I'm going to be your hope and your comfort and all these things that you need. But I want you to constantly be looking to me and trusting in me. 
not this attitude. So in that sense, we are reflecting Christ. We reflect what he's given to us as it comes inwardly, and we receive the word of God, and we draw close in fellowship with him. Then we can portray Christ. Then that's the idea of what Matthew 5.16 is referring to. When he says, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. It is reflecting the Son. It's reflecting His holiness and His goodness through our life. Not to lift up self or not for any of, look at how good we are and look at how much we're like, you know, how God-like we are. No, not at all. It's this is what Christ has done for me. Look at how He's changed me and and I can be a blessing to you. So with that, Looking at some verses there concerning that, he says, how are we going to do this? We're to be renewed in the spirit of your mind. Be renewed in the spirit of your mind. We find that in Ephesians chapter 4, verses 23 and 24. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 23 and 24. And be renewed, he says, in the spirit of your mind, and that ye put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness after God. It's created in righteousness. It's created in His holiness, not self-righteousness, not the righteousness of the Pharisees, not the righteousness of those, the religious of that time. It's His righteousness, His holiness. He wants us to be partakers of His holiness. We find that in Hebrews 12.10. He tells us, when you're chastened, it's for a purpose. It's for correction. It's to guide you so that you can be partakers and learn my holiness. But 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 4, it says, Whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these ye might be partakers of the divine nature. Not in a pride sense, and we must emphasize that. It's a humility before him. Having escaped then the corruption that is in the world through lust. Going right along with what John has said here in 1 John, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, once again, 1 John chapter 2, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, it's not of the Father, it's of the world. That's going to pass away. It's not going to last. So we're going to exemplify our Heavenly Father here on earth is what he wants us to do. We, we can become more Christ-like. And that's what he has wanted us to do. I look forward to seeing the last point as we get to this. But moving on. He says, I become more holy gradually as my understanding of him becomes more clear. In 2 Corinthians, we find this idea in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse number 18. It says, but we all with open face beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. Hmm. How do we do that? Well, by looking in his divine word. That's the only source, the only way that we have, looking into God's word and through his word, praying and asking for his, his guidance through the Holy Spirit who will guide you into truth as we've talked about. He's going to give us that thing. James chapter 1, I like how it puts it here, this idea of that glass. Referring to that glass, what is it talking about? It's talking about a mirror. It's talking about something that reflects, that you'll see. James chapter 1, verse 23 through 25 says, For if any man be a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like unto a man beholding his natural face in a glass. For he beholdeth himself, and goeth his way, and straightway forgetteth what manner of man he was. But verse 25 says, But whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty, and continueth therein, he being not a forgetful hearer, But a doer of that work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. What is the Christian life about? The Christian life is about reading through the pages of this book, reflecting, understanding, asking God for that. Open now mine eyes, that I may behold wondrous things out of thy law. That's our prayer and our heart's desire. Blessed are the pure in heart, as he preached there, for they shall see God. That idea, that, that, that's our desire. How are we going to see God? It, so many people look at the idea of seeing God as some kind of, or we're looking for the sign, right? We're looking for the big supernatural. I remember thinking, you know, meeting people, and they, they got the 
the, the alcohol in one hand and the, you know, the smoking in the other. I saw Jesus, let me tell you. I saw a 40 foot Jesus standing at the foot of my bed. No, you didn't. <laughs> you saw some, something apparition, but that wasn't Jesus. I promise you that. And, uh, but what are we seeking? We want this supernatural. I want to see lights. I want to see something special. I want to see something big. And that will make everybody believe. It's a sign. Well, what did he tell him at that time? Don't ask for a sign. He says, no, you're asking for the wrong thing. What do I want you to do? I want you to seek me through my word. I want to become real to you through this. As I said at the beginning, I want you to be still and know that I am God. Through my word, through what I've given here, that's what I want from you. God's word is perfect. It's divine. It will guide us into this truth. It will guide us into that relationship and that walk with him, that fellowship with him. But we have to, be, we have to love it. We have to be in his word, seeking him through here. And yes, there's supernatural things that take place. Yes, there is the peace that passes all understanding. There is the lives that are changed, the addictions that are broken, the sin that's overcome, that power that you can experience with God when you go to him humbly and honestly and say, God, I desire to be like you, but you know this flesh desires the things of this world. You know this flesh desires these things, and I'm, I want to lay it aside. God, change my desires. And he gives you that victory, and he gives you the change of heart and a change of sight and a change of mind to see those things. Those are the things that God wants a life to be seen. That's how he wants to display himself. When we want it to be like, you know, the old cartoon, the masters of the universe, we want lightning to come down and the sword to glow and all the things. That, that, we want that kind of excitement. No, that's not it. It's a walk in the fellowship that reflects his holiness and the fruit of the Spirit through our lives. That's what he has for us. So looking at this is what God's going back to 1 John chapter 2 then. He says, as we saw, or 1 John chapter 3, sorry, verse 2. Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that when we, he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And we've been focusing on this idea. And every man that hath this hope in him purifieth himself even as he is pure. I'm going to close with this thought and this idea that goes along with this is this thought that we are declared righteous, right, through Jesus Christ. Justified, that simple definition, but be declared righteous. His righteousness covering our sins. But he says that's the purity, that's the standing that you have in Christ. Now I want you to walk in that standing. I want you to walk in that purity. Walk in that life. Of course, through the word of God, allowing him to do these things, fulfilling the purpose that he has for his, our life. You know, we often get caught up in that idea of, you know, the predestination or, or things like that. I, predestination is simply this. Look at Romans 8, 29. Romans chapter 8, verse 29. What is predestination? It's according to his foreknowledge. That's one thing. I can't read verse 29 without reading verse 28 first, right? There you go. We know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. He has a purpose. What is his purpose? What is his divine predestination? You know, the big spooky word, predestination. For whom he did foreknow, according to his divine knowledge, he knows the choices that will be made. But what does it say? He also did predestinate. And so many people take that to mean he predestinated them to heaven or he predestinated them to hell. No, he predestined those that accepted Jesus Christ to do what? To be conformed to the image of his son. That's the idea of predestination. We're going to be like him, conformed in him. Not like him in the fact we're going to have our own planet and start our own, you know, that kind of spooky craziness. No! He says we're going to have his holiness and his purity and we're going to come closer and closer. We're going to walk in him. We're going to learn faith. We're going to learn trust. We're going to see him as he is. These things that he's given to us, he says, he predestined us that we might be the firstborn among many brethren. For what purpose? To share it with others and to bring others along. 
our family, our friends, our relatives. The purpose of living a Christ-like life is to bring honor to God, number one. But number two, it's to point people to Christ. This is what he's done for me. I want to share this truth with you. And that's what, you know, we talk about soul winning or outreach. We call it outreach and things of that nature. What is outreach truly? It's living the Christian life and showing it through your life to others in the sense of that this is what God's, the changes he's made, and this is what I want to share with you. And as God's word fills us up, we can't help but share it with others and bring it out. And then that gives it power and meaning, a true testimony that's pure before God. So as we think about that wonderful relationship that we have with him, we are the sons of God, and we shall be like him. Not as Satan, not as Lucifer, but we shall be like him in that he's holy. And even that hope that we have purifieth himself even as he is pure. So let's pray for that. Let's ask God, give us that purity. Give us that, that walk with you, that fellowship with you that can be a testimony and a witness for you. That's the goal that we have as individuals. So examine ourselves. Before we close, um, we're going to go together in prayer. We spend um, on Wednesday nights. We'll take some time. We divide up. We've, we've done it in a couple different ways. Yes, sir. Okay. All right. So we will stay together and just pray. We do what's called, a for those visiting, um, we do a... Um, Thank you. Symphony of prayer. There's the word that wasn't coming to me. And uh, what, it, what it is and entails basically is we try to agree with one another in prayer through the Holy Spirit. ABCs in the fact that audible, we've got to be able to hear you. We pray into our seat. You can't hear what they're saying. And that's not going to help anybody. So we pray audibly, briefly, not long. Uh, try to stay on point, one or two things. Stay on point with something and then allow someone to come alongside and agree with you on that and allow them to do that. And so then, and we don't limit it to, oh, you prayed one time, that's it. No, we can pray a couple times as the Spirit leads us, and we'll do that for a little bit here. And then uh, we'll close in prayer after that. So let's go to the Lord in prayer. Yes, sir. So she's back home. So, all right. 